Hello everyone, welcome to this presentation of the world map of malware, the geography of hostile code. I am Trip9, I'm one of the field sales engineers here at Komodo Cybersecurity. We also have Dr. Kenneth Gears, our chief research scientist, who's going to be speaking as well. I'll be doing the intro, Kenneth's going to take over the, the body of the webinar, and then I will wrap things up. So to start, I'd like to give you a brief introduction of Komodo Cybersecurity. Many may be aware of Komodo Cybersecurity from our SSL certificate days. We still are the global leader in SSL certificates. We've been around now for over two decades. However, back in 2004, we, get, we began to develop next generation endpoint security technology. And since then, we've been provisioned on, on over 86 million endpoints worldwide with our actual endpoint security technology. And globally now, we have over 1,200 employees. We're based out of Clifton, New Jersey, where we have a 24 by 7 global security operations center. And on a day-to-day -day basis, we are seeing around 1 to 2 million unknown brand new files that we are providing analysis on, and about 5% turn out to be brand new malicious threats. So that's about 50,000 to 100,000 brand new zero-day threats per day that we're actually doing analysis on. What I'd like to bring your attention to is recently, in 2018, we've gotten a few different awards for our endpoint security technology. We actually got the top product award by avtest.org and also Best Endpoint Security Product by Cyber Defense Magazine, uh, the winner for 2018. And at RSA, uh, earlier this year in April, we actually got recognized by SC Magazine as having the Best Managed uh, Security Service Award. Now, let me go to the 10,000-foot view. I want to go all the way back to the 80s and just talk about how this industry began. And in a nutshell, just to bring up some fun facts, tank of gas was under a dollar uh, per gallon. Obviously, the Simpsons cartoon was first introduced then. But would you believe it? In 1987, there was only a total of five computer viruses. That was it, just five. And during that time, um, a well-known man, John McAfee, introduced McAfee Software. And it initially was introduced as virus cleanup software. It wasn't antivirus software. It was just the ability to actually go in and clean up an infected machine because there wasn't a ton of viruses. Now, very quickly, though, John McAfee had the light bulb idea of changing it from virus cleanup software to antivirus software. So instead of cleaning up the few infected machines, we are going to block viruses on all the good machines to keep the viruses out. Hence, antivirus was born. The whole idea of we're going to deny stuff that we know that's bad, but everything else that is good or unknown to us, we're going to allow onto the machines. Now, let's fast forward to the decades. As you can see here, this whole premise and philosophy worked quite well through the 80s, the 90s, the early 2000s. But something happened around 2009, 2010, where brand new zero-day malware began to just skyrocket. And now, would you believe it, in 2017 alone, there was over 120 million new pieces of unique malware that were created. They were started as actual zero-day unknown files, which means that they weren't blacklisted or verdicted by antivirus vendors. They were assumed as good files until they were known as bad files. Now, security stacks out there have tried to solve this problem in a variety of ways. Besides your, your blacklist, your whitelist, obviously new tech was introduced over the years. I'm going to push forward the next screen. You had behavioral analysis and sandboxing, which would catch additional percentage, you know, uh, more of these zero-day threats. And then your HIPs, your host intrusion prevention. Back in 2013, artificial intelligence was introduced. And now we got next generation machine learning and EDR, endpoint detection and response. Altogether, it gets a really high percentage. Uh, it blocks a really high percentage of these threats. We're going to peg that number at 99%. 
my question is, what about the 1%? Some may argue it's a little less than 1%, could be a little more than 1%, but just for argument's sake, let's say, what about that 1%? If we actually divide, I'm going to scroll back just for a second here, that 120 million, <clears throat> um, well, if we multiply it just by 1%, that's 1 1.2 million threats that we're saying theoretically could get by the security stack. If you divide that out by 365 days per year, that's over 3,000 threats per day that current solution stacks have difficulty solving. So that's really the main problem that we're, we're pointing out. So I'm going to pick up at the end of the presentation. Kenneth's going to go in and talk about the geography of hostile code right now. But I just want you to remember, uh, I will be talking about the 1% and how the 1% is solved with Komodo Cybersecurity. So just let me make a quick introduction for Dr. Kenneth Gears. Dr. Kenneth Gears has been with us for a uh, few years now. He's a former NCIS and NATO member, served 20 years for the U.S. government in various capacities. He's written multiple articles and now does a lot of um, research and malware analysis for us here at Komodo Cybersecurity. So, Kenneth, take it away. Thank you so much, Trip. Uh, so, it's a pleasure to be here. I've been in this space since uh, 1993. Uh, I worked at NSA a little bit on as a on offense as a intelligence analyst, uh, and then I moved to NCIS and did defense and. One more American football analogy, I think at, at NATO I did to the academic side, so sort of special teams. And so for me, uh, this, uh, you know, taking an academic view of, of uh, cybersecurity is, is always been natural uh, to look at the big picture. But the fun thing about working at Komodo is that I get about 5 million rows of data every day. So each week I see uh, malware detections in every country on the planet. So I'm going to show you also some, some data um, from North Korea, right? So the, the, the strategic side of this is really important to get your mind around because as an enterprise and as a person, we are all definitely in the line of fire. So this is uh, all the little dots that you can't see. Those are countries where we detected uh, certain uh, uh, malware types. And then you can see the major types in the middle, Trojan, application, etc. And we'll dive into that a little bit. But on this slide, just think of the international space, really, right? The challenges that that poses for law enforcement uh, network security, national security, counterintelligence, uh, national sovereignty, right? So during times of election or even uh, business, uh, corporate espionage, etc., it's very much an international space and it's hard to deter attacks and it's hard to do what, what the government would like to do is some kind of arms control or law enforcement uh, action. Right. So I'm just going to look at two of these malware types, kind of blow them up uh, just a tiny bit. You can actually, just like going from quantum to stellar, you can blow this up uh, in so many ways and see how complex things are. In the worm category, I just want to highlight the speed with which malware uh, can target you and take down. We, we know that worms, for example, they, you know, they take advantage of vulnerabilities automatically, right? So they're going to travel the web looking for certain targets, either very specific targets or as many targets as possible. So .in is India, TR is Turkey, uh, RU is Russia. Um, the big green spikes are India and Turkey, but the Russian activity is scattered uh, every day. Uh, Russia has terrible uh, um, network security problems, uh, and not only in terms of uh, quantity, but uh, variety uh, every day. Here, I'll just point out the brown talk worm, for example, is our top worm for, for Q2. It was originally written over 10 years ago in Indonesia, 
it's been often associated with geopolitical activity. So it's been used to target the Israeli government, Playboy magazine, various things that um, for cultural, political, religious reasons people dislike. So, but what I see as an analyst is it often uh, will be used to invade a particular space. Um, this, and you can see hundreds of worms here, but they are getting uh, attackers closer to targets for really one of three types of uh, um, cyber attack. There's data theft, data denial, and data manipulation. They kind of come in that order in terms of sophistication and frequency. So on this, I'll just highlight one more malware type, and it's a Trojan. And a Trojan is often called the Swiss Army knife of malware because instead of hundreds, there are thousands, right, that we detect every day. Uh, but it's not. It's this is more countries and a more evenly uh, dispersed uh, country set. So you can see dot de uh, is Germany. Right, that big orange cluster in the middle. I'll present something on this at Black Hat in, in, in a couple of weeks um, at the Komodo booth. But I want to look at, you know, what happened in Germany at that time. If there was not just Trojans, but other stuff. Any case, Trojans can be used for anything, right? Uh, any of the major types of attack. So. Me as a remote attacker, I now have access to your computer with remote admin access, right? So I can choose to steal information, block information, or manipulate it in some way. A lot of this activity in Germany, I can tell you, took place around Frankfurt, which I also uh, looked in the news, uh, and it's, it's a real hub for cyber espionage uh, today. Uh, so. That's one, just two of about 17 primary malware types that I look at on a daily basis. Um, if you want more information, send, send me an email uh, and we can discuss. I want to move into uh, geopolitics now because here is where malware detection for many people comes alive. Timelines are often an analyst's best friend. Right, because whether it's a SYNAC or whether it's a swipe to the right or swipe to the left, you know, somebody is waiting, a computer or a person, on your response. And, and time often shows you uh, everything you need to know about, uh, about an attack because we're all bounded by some kind of limitation, right? So if I drop. <clears throat> all of the malware detections that we see on a timeline for any given country, I can usually tell you um, when the major geopolitical events were, right? And sometimes the more closed to the country or the more exotic the country, it is clear as day. On this, this is the United States for Q2 2018, and I was a little bit surprised to see this, and some of this may be coincidental. However, if you follow my logic, the largest single spike was on March 13th. So me as an analyst, I'm wondering, okay, what happened at this time? And it took me all of about a minute uh, to see the answer. At least in part, what happened on March 13th was not only that Donald Trump announced our new Secretary of State and new CIA director, but intelligence services, uh, maybe some hacktivists, but some cyber criminals that would like to sell information or gather sensitive information in a uh, perhaps a contractor type way, they got busy, right? And they all of a sudden there are a host of new intelligence collection requirements, right? Whether you're sitting in country X, Y, or Z, and in this case, you know um, we detect malware in 237 country codes. So truly, the planet is swimming in malware. But on March 13th, we have the highest single spike, and at least a good portion of this will be associated with a major geopolitical shift. All of a sudden, intelligence services have a host of new requirements through which they're going to fulfill uh, information collection, analysis, intelligence reporting via computer network operations, usually called cyber espionage in the most common case. 
if we look at sort of the, the, the defensive side, uh, you'll see more of it here. Here are all of our um, detections in China, so all 17 malware types. And there's one day that really stands out, June 4th. And those who are a little bit older uh, will remember that 1985, 1989, uh, June 4 is the Tiananmen Square. Uh, political protest. And so every year, uh, I'm sure the chart will look something like this. And the reason for it is that uh, numerous uh, intelligence services, both foreign and domestic, will be seeking to either collect and or protect uh, sensitive information, to gather information or to help massage uh, the space, right, the physical space via the network space. Um, but numerous countries will be seeking information on this critical day just in case um, political protests erupt again that would, um, that would cause a shift in, in international relations or security. So here, if we just move the map slightly and look at South Korea, here, these are Trojan detections actually for, uh, for this quarter, Q2. And the highest single spikes, unsurprisingly, they are associated with the, the major annual U.S.-South Korean military exercises. And this is Trojan activity. And so most of it will be, you know, intel services that want to know more information about what's happening. I mean, if you think about it, sometimes a, a major military exercise like that could be a cover for an invasion. Right, so that's how serious it would be, and we know how serious the North Korea and now Russia from this week take military exercises on their border. So in this case, you know, you just think about it, China, Japan, Russia, those are just the immediate players, right, who would be very interested in what's going on in South Korea. One research paper I'm working on basically is trying to prove mathematically that missile launches from North Korea in 2017 yield a higher uh, malware detection rate in South Korea, right? So in other words, every time there's a missile launch, there is a bump uh, in malware detection. And the reason is, is because people, uh, it's a crisis event for not only some intelligence services, but countries. And so they really need more information quickly. So Armenia in, um, in April of 2018, and you may have seen this, but you know, it's a little bit more obscure in the news, but you can see um, the relationship between network security and national security fairly clearly here. So in Armenia, there was what's called a velvet revolution, right? A fairly smooth political transition caused by thousands of people coming onto the streets and demanding less corruption, you know, better government, etc. And so, what will happen here is whether you're a student, a soldier, a spy, or a statesman, or a security specialist, what you do, now you do online, right? So most of our work is somehow online. And malware for uh, intelligence and military political operatives uh, plays an important role in either stealing or preventing the theft of, of information for some, some grander purpose, right? So in this case, you can see quite clearly that a political revolution will come with uh, a major amount of hacking activity. So let's go one more slide, I believe, and this is the last one uh, that I'll show you, uh, but I've got, I've got you know, two or three times this number for Q2. I just can't show you them all in a short uh, presentation. But if you have certain countries that you are interested in, and I also do research in verticals, so how healthcare compares to education, for example. So in this last one, I want to talk about uh, the summit this week in Finland between uh, President Trump and Putin, right? So. Sometimes I just say, well, what, what is the major spike, you know, for Egypt? And then you can usually see that there was some police action or military tension uh, at the time. But you can come the other way as well and say, all right, there's an upcoming event, you know, it, perhaps in your case, a business merger or an acquisition, uh, something like that for your, either your company or in your vertical space. 
so here there's a there's a major geopolitical event taking place. The whole world's eyes are on you know Finland this week. So I went. I, so I looked at some of the major uh, um, dates, and primarily when did the world become aware of this summit? And it was June twentieth, twenty first was when it was originally reported in the news. So then I look through our malware, and very quickly I see a, a, a brilliant pink spike in the data. So I isolated that for this chart. Uh, but you can see that you've got a major event, uh, major virus outbreak on the date in question. And then the kicker, I didn't, I didn't have room to add it in this presentation, is that all of this virus activity occurred not just in Helsinki, in the neighborhood where the summit took place, right, called Vanta. So um, what, what happens in that case is that, you know, you, you have to get close to your target, right, not, uh, not just, uh, not just uh, logically, but physically sometimes. I, I, I drew our, a map of our malware co uh, detections in Washington, D.C. For, for a conference recently uh, in Washington, and you could see a bright ring around the White House. So, um, so malware is definitely used on a daily basis. And what I want to say is that uh, it, it, pay attention to geopolitical events because you and your enterprise are in the line of fire. Uh, nation states, you know, they need, um, and their proxies, right, uh, cyber criminals that might be working for a government somehow, they need infrastructure, right? So you may have in your uh, you know, in your business space or within your enterprise, a certain uh, attractiveness uh, as a target, but you could also just be a stepping stone as well. And I think, so from my presentation, I want to say it's the complexity of malware, the speed, as we saw with worms uh, and viruses, and the diversity with Trojans. All of these mean that, uh, in part, the one of the central philosophical um, thrusts at Komodo is containment uh, of unknown code. So if if code is unknown on your system, it will be contained and not touch your operating system, not touch your data. And so, um, you know, through these geopolitical stories, in part, I'd like to just uh, emphasize my point uh, in that. It's a hostile cyberspace. You know, if you buy a computer at Best Buy, plug it into the wall, it will be seconds before it's tapped, right? Uh, not in a targeted fashion, but before it sees random malicious code. Now, if you're working for an important enterprise, you will also see targeted attacks. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for, your, for your time, and we're happy to take questions and happy to, for you to email me as well in the future at kenneth.gears at komodo.com. Yeah, thank you, Kenneth. And just to recap, everyone, uh, I know that we had a few that just joined on the line. Kenneth was just going over the type of data sets that we gather from our 86 million endpoints that have our uh, security endpoint security protection software installed on them globally. And we get a lot of data from every country, so we're able to see the, the geopolitical events that are transpiring in real time. And to Add a little bit more relevance to this. Everyone is probably aware of the uh, the Mueller report that just came out, uh, the indictments against the 12 Russian GRU officials. Again, the type of malware that was used to hack into the DNC in this report, it was a simple keylogger with screenshot surveillance software used to capture more credentials. It eventually was used to hack into DNC computers and steal more documents. This is the type of data that Komodo sees. And again, these are zero day threats that many other antivirus vendors out there still haven't blacklisted yet. So we're able to see brand new real-time malware. We do an analysis on it, but we're able to see where they're attacking, if it's nation states attacking governments, if it's uh, certain malicious actors hacking enterprises. We see all the data. We don't only zoom in by geolocation, but we can also zoom in by actual industry. So we can see what's happening on the banking industry today, what's happening in the publishing industry today, or what's happening in retail, or you name it. This brings me to my next point. <clears throat> we have a public threat map available. I'm going to go into the 1% in a second here. Again, bringing back to my original question, what about the 1%? If current security stacks can really resolve about 99% of the, of the 
problems or the threats right now. What about the 1%? We have a public available uh, threat map that I believe it's in the actual link section, attachments and links. You'll be able to click on it and you can see in real time all of the 86 million endpoints that are phoning home to us and reporting what threats that we're seeing out there uh, and also the malware that we're verdicting. And again, this is about 100,000 brand new zero-day malicious threats that we actually verdict every single 24 hours. Of that, we provide a sample set of zero-day unknowns, which you can actually zoom in. You can go to virus total. You can see which vendors have blacklisted them yet and which still classify them as a unknown, assumed good file. This is uh, a very helpful uh, map to understand what threats are out there, how long they've been out there. For example, what you're seeing on the screen right now is an actual brand new uh, ransomware strand that has been active, uh, at least to our knowledge, for about 27 hours, 14 minutes, and 38 seconds. And the clock is ticking. And would you believe it, at the time that I took this snapshot, there was only about 20 or so out of the 67 endpoint security vendors out there that had actually blacklisted it. The other 47, it's Russian roulette. They may be able to block it with their hips, their machine learning, their artificial intelligence, or they may not. That in lies the, the main issue with the, the 1%. It's like playing a game of Russian roulette, where if there's a brand new zero-day threat out there, machine learning may catch it or it may not. And you could do further analysis on your own. Again, the attachment or the link for this public threat map is in the attachment uh, area inside of BrightTalk. What I wanted to point out here is the way that we deal with unknown code, as Kenneth was saying, is we auto-contain it. 100% of unknown files that hit our machine, code that we're not aware of, it gets auto-contained. We cut off system access, bulletproofing that machine and that network down to hour zero. Literally, we have had zero infections across 86 million machines globally since we have installed. Because the way that our actual software was written is anything that we haven't already classified as a good file, it gets auto-contained. Now, you may be asking, well, what about the usability of that? operationally speaking, we still allow the user to interact with that file. We don't provide or we don't cut off user access to that file. They get to access it and use it while we watch the behavior and do analysis on it while it's being contained. Um, we're just not going to allow it to write to the system because what if it's a piece of ransomware? Uh, if it's a piece of ransomware, all those API calls are rerouted to a, a very light footprint virtualized uh, part of the machine where we're going to allow it to write, we're going to watch its behavior, but it's not going to be encrypting anything on the actual system itself. So that's the brilliance of auto containment. And this allows us to really deal with that last 1% problem. So think about it. 120 million new pieces of malicious code are being produced yearly now. We get those statistics from avtest.org. And 99% covers you most of the way, but there's still about 1.2 million that are problems. They're actual threats. You divide that out by 365 days a year, that's still 3,000 threats per day that current solutions cannot solve. What do we do with those 3,000 threats? We auto-contain them, bulletproofing the customer from any ransomware, credential stealing malware, Trojans, rootkits, as well as not affecting operations and user uh, productivity if it's an actual good file. So that is the that is our advanced endpoint in a nutshell. And we want to end this webinar with two services we'd like to offer those that have taken some time to be on the line with us. We have a, a tool known as Forensic Analysis, which we can give um, to those who would want it. It's a complementary malware scan where you give us a few machines and we'll show you what your current uh, endpoint vendor hasn't classified. Or if there's been stealthy, hidden, or advanced malware that has snuck by, 
again, as we can see, there are a lot of of uh, problems still at a 99% catch rate or HIPS or uh, machine learning uh, prevention rate. So allow us to do a forensic analysis scan on a couple of your machines and we'll show you if there is any unknown or malicious files on that machine. Now the second is a, a real treat for any organization on the line with us that is over 1,000 employees. So we've invested a lot of money and also time into building out external threat intelligence to where we have a lot of uh, data on actual dark websites such as leakedforms.net, exploit.in, the Tor network, and, a, and about 500,000 crime servers globally where we're seeing malware suck credentials off of employees' machines and, uh, and user devices, partners, vendors, or customers. And we'll, uh, we're seeing that data being exfiltrated and sent to these command and control servers globally. We can do an analysis on your company's domain if you're, um, if you're uh, in the position to receive such a report, and we can provide this to you to say, hey, here's the visibility that we have, and you can compare that against your current threat intelligence vendor to see if they're missing anything, or if you don't have one, at least you can get a good picture of what's out there on the dark web that I don't know about. Again, this is no cost, so take advantage of this. This is only for a limited time. Uh, we're going to be running this through... A, uh, about Black Hat, but then after that, we may stop with this uh, promotional. So take advantage of that. Again, any companies over a thousand employees, if you go over to the attachment and link section right now, you'll see complimentary custom threat intelligence report. Click on that link, fill out your information. We'll have one of our sales reps get in contact with you and you'll be able to get, it's about a 13 page executive PDF report that we encrypt and we go over all the different malware that we've seen uh, do damage on your partners, vendors, customers, or internal employees based on our visibility in the dark web. One thing that I'll mention is what we're seeing trending in 2018 based on the amount of data and volume that we have, like Kenneth was going over, uh, is we're seeing Azeroth malware, which is a type of credential stealing malware, wreak absolute havoc on enterprises here in the U.S. Uh, we're seeing things like pony exploits or S uh, SLR malware being blocked now. Those were a problem back in 2017. But now that it's 2018, Azeroth malware is a huge issue where it's evading a lot of uh, various endpoint detection capabilities, getting on the machine, it's exfiltrating passwords directly out of a Google Chrome uh, password manager, Internet Explorer, Firefox, and sending them right to a crime server in Eastern Europe or Russia. We have visibility into all that, and we'd like to give that to you at no cost. So click that link right now. And now what we're going to do is we're going to go off to questions from the audience. I think Maureen or Asaf is going to field some questions, but we'd like to uh, go into those. Okay, great. Thank you, Tripp. Yeah, yep. we have a couple of questions that came in. Um, let me get this up here. Okay. So uh, the first question is uh, probably good uh, for uh, Kenneth. This one is for you. Um, do cyber threats differ between consumer and enterprise clients? I think the primary difference would be that uh, you know, a professional cybersecurity staff at, at the strategic level, I can tell you that there is a huge difference between uh, richer and poorer countries, right? So there's a, probably a good analogy here. Um, richer countries, the application malware, uh, more current backdoors and Trojans. Poorer countries, um, older worms and viruses predominate. Uh, they're taking you know, low-hanging fruit. Think of the difference between uh, Switzerland and Somalia, right? There's, there's uh, one really requires you know advanced code and, and hackers and uh, and another. So on the home side of things, uh, there is just not going to be the uh, the kind of attention given to patching and hardening of systems, et cetera. 
And so, I mean, think about it at home, you know, what, what are your kids doing on the network? Even the CIA director, I don't know if you remember this story, but took, was taking a laptop, a work laptop home that his kids wound up using, do, using for homework and surfing the web, right? This is a true story. So at home, you know, all things are, and that's why some, some organizations, for example, they're really hardening the, uh, the core. Right, and they're allowing more more user behavior or greater uh, latitude in user behavior on their devices, and they're but they're saying you can't connect, you know, to the corporate network, and that's really interesting because you know the number of ways someone could get in. At home, things are are a lot more. Um, you know, you're just not going to have a professional staff, and so it's that makes it even more important, right, to have uh, to think at home to have a, a, um, a reliable uh, antivirus, a reliable intrusion detection software, et cetera, on your system because it's, you know, you don't have time. You know, you primarily want to, you know, shop, find a date and, and uh, you know, play games and, and Netflix. So it's the difference between having a professional staff devoted to an issue and none at all. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, second question we have um, is, is the threat map you showed previously live and is it something your clients have access to? Yes. If I'm, let me just scroll back to that so everyone can see that because I know that there's a few that joined late. Take a look at this. This is available publicly, not just to our clients, but also to anyone that wants to see brand new zero day samples. Feel free to test them against your current endpoint vendor in a virtual in a VM to see how well it performs. But this is available out there, and it's the actual link is inside of the uh, it's inside of attachments and links in this Bright Talk platform. So if you go scroll down to the last link, Komodo Cybersecurity Threat Intelligence Map, you can click that right now. You can bookmark it, save it, but it's a continual revolving stream of brand new, fresh malware, just live zero days. And we actually give, you can sign up for a free Valkyrie account and you can actually then download those fresh samples, which maybe your vendor has yet to verdict yet. And then you can begin to see how well their hips, their machine learning, their behavioral analysis actually works. So, and if it if it does stop it, but again, it's a game of Russian roulette. We've seen times where various vendors have stopped stuff. Other times they have to wait 27, 36 hours until it actually gets updated on their blacklist. And then again, the, the normal AV will stop it. But until then, the, the hips, the behavioral analysis, the machine learning just hasn't seen that type of code yet. So it can get by. And that's the attack time surface that a hacker is going to have to play on that particular network. Okay, great. Um, another question. What types of credential stealing malware is Komodo cybersecurity seeing trend in 2018? Okay, so I'll take that one again. We are still seeing a lot of damage done by uh, pony exploits. It's a type of Russian credential stealing malware. But again, like I mentioned before, we're seeing Azeril malware, which is another family that steals passwords off of a machine, uh, do a lot more damage. There's been a lot of uh, vulnerabilities plugged up in various endpoint machines to really stop pony exploits. But Azrael malware is knows how to evade those. So when it comes to um, customers of larger banks, we're seeing a lot of those customers get hit with Azrael malware, as well as uh, other larger enterprises, their actual partners and vendors. And again, this is all available to anyone that wants it. If your organization is above 1,000 employees, take advantage of the complimentary custom threat intelligence report. It's a link instead of the attachments and link section. And I'm already seeing multiple people uh, requested in real time right now. So good on you. Good. That's great. Um, another question. Uh, this uh, is probably a good one for Kenneth. So Kenneth, 
is it possible that I have nation state hackers on my enterprise network? How do I tell? Depending on the size and location of your enterprise network, um, you know, it lies the answer. But I, based on my experience, I would say the answer is almost certainly yes. And the reason is, is that um, advanced, even criminals in cyberspace, but certain, but all hackers, they need infrastructure, right? And in other words, if the target is the White House, it's not like they're, you know, they're hacking from the Kremlin to the White House or vice versa directly. It, hacking consists of building a huge infrastructure of stepping stones, right, to get to your target. And the more logical, uh, you know, the communications uh, between, you know, uh, source and target, the um, the easier it is to get away with the operation. So, um, when maybe I'll make a provocative statement here. I think that all nation states are involved in hacking, even Vatican City, right? And the reason is is because Vatican City would have so much money and assets around the world. They have a diplomatic corps. You might not know that, but they do. Um, there is there is simply too much to protect in terms of sovereignty. Uh, intellectual property, uh, you know, et cetera. So my point is, is that this space is is kind of like outer space getting really cluttered with junk, right? And cyber espionage is the thing. Cyber espionage is okay, right? International law says, and international norms uh, dictate that uh, espionage is okay because most of it can be justified as defensive in nature. The trouble with computer network operations is if I'm in position to read your email, I'm also in position to change your email, which is a lot more dramatic and at the government level requires a lot more authorization. But the problem is, is for you and your enterprise, uh, some you know hackers might be sitting on your email server or corporate network, um, and it might be they're using it for a stepping stone, such as you know a buffer area between you know them and their target, uh, or a, a, a drop site for tools or data exfil. But um, the, you always have to worry about it. Now, if you're in a country that has poor human rights record, um, you know your own government, in fact, might be hacking you on a regular basis. Right. So and we know from just news from people attacking Google, um, you know, nation states are quite busy if it's a lucrative target. If you're in the online services, information technology space, these are platforms that uh, from a military perspective are considered uh, force multipliers. Like you're sitting in the middle of the chessboard if you offer, you know, online communications, if you offer you know, software support, you know, as a contractor or something, you're a, such a juicy target, right? Because someone would love to get inside your space because then then there are many unknown things that they might, uh, benefits that they might reap in the future. There was one case in the middle of July 2014 when the Syrian Electronic Army took down a range of online websites uh, related to telecoms, Viber, Truecaller, Tango, all in the space of one week. And the reason is, is because they wanted that signals intelligence data, you know, because they're fighting a war within Syria. But going online, af going on, on after online services, you know, that provide Skype-like functionality gives you all kinds of spies and journalists and, uh, you know, human rights activists that a government might, might worry about. So all of that to say is, long story short, absolutely pay attention to the news and be aware that you are a target for likely multiple, you know, nation state hacker operations that you can scarcely imagine, you know, the source uh, and target. You're just in the crossfire. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Uh, next question. How does Komodo's auto containment in Intel know if unknown malware is actually safe to release it? Okay, I'll take that one. 
So auto, con uh, auto containment, if we don't have an actual signature for that particular code, we are going to cut off system access 100% of the time. This is what bulletproofs organizations that use advanced endpoint protection. Because anything that we've never seen before, we're not just going to let run on the machine. Now, the whole industry differs where it's based on a sum, it's called assumptive based trust, where if we don't know that it's bad, a bad executable, we're going to assume that it's good until we know that it's bad. Again, that philosophy was introduced back in 1987 with John McAfee creating antivirus. So anti as in blocking, virus as in bad, from entering the machine or the network. And that worked well through the 80s and 90s, the early 2000s, but with the rise of zero-day threats to the tune of uh, 120 million brand-new zero-day threats per year now, it's a huge issue. So the way that we've solved it and been able to um, – bulletproof customers is 100% of the time if an unknown file comes onto the machine that we don't have a verdict for, it will go directly into auto containment uh, where we cut off system access and from a technical standpoint, what we're saying is we are not going to allow any write privileges to the COM, the registry, or the actual disk of that machine. We're going to reroute those API calls to a safe environment, a uh, separate environment uh, on that machine where it's virtualized and we're going to watch the file. Within about 45 seconds, uh, we usually have a pretty good understanding of the actual file, what it's trying to do. And if it's good, we release it into the machine. If it's bad, we kick it off. Now, it, th there's something I'm going to say that is helpful to understand. 92% of the time to 95% of the time, we're able to get a 100% confidence like a verdict of, okay, this is a good file or it's a bad file. The other 5 to 8% of the time, we actually have a dedicated human expert team. It's under our, uh, it's called Control, Komodo Threat Research Labs. It's about 200 individuals that are actually looking at very advanced malicious code or very advanced code and really unpacking the binaries themselves and doing research on it to see is this uh, malicious or not. Because our machine learning, we're not trying to force it 100% of it through machine learning or artificial intelligence like some other companies. Uh, we're under, we understand that there's brand new code that is going to be able to skip over a particular algorithm. We pass that along to our human expert team. These are uh, trained uh, SOC professionals that know how to do reverse engineering on malware. That's the other advantage you get with Komodo when it comes to our endpoint protection product is you get a whole entire uh, threat hunting team which is going to actually look at the actual malware, uh, the actual code itself, unpack those binaries, and make a, a full confidence uh, thumbs up or thumbs down on if it's malicious. We have a few other questions that are flowing in. Uh, do you have a percentage breakdown of how much each system detects? So HIPS versus Sandbox versus uh, other, so AV as a service. Let me go back to the stack screen. <clears throat> so back a few here, and I'll, I'll break out some percentages for you. So traditionally, with various vendors out there, they're going to have their, their AV, and then on top of that, you have a few other layers, behavioral analysis, sandboxing, host intrusion prevention, artificial intelligence, and then, you know, for the real advanced stuff, your machine learning, EDR, and as an industry as a whole, we're seeing that about 99% uh, uh, blockage rate. When you add all the layers together, 99.5 maybe, but the last little percentage is 100% of everything else that is unknown it gets trapped in auto containment for us. So everything else that our current layers don't catch gets trapped in auto containment, bulletproofing the customer. Now, uh, so I don't have an exact answer to that question as far as um, what's caught, what's the percentage caught by HIPS versus uh, sandboxing. Uh, the the underlying issue is that, or the, the underlying response though, is that 100% of stuff that's unknown 
uh, will be uh, caught, either by the more traditional or next-gen layers or the advanced auto containment layer. We don't allow anything system access unless we fully vetted it as being good. Great, thanks. Oh. There's another one. Yeah. Yep, yes. Uh, is it possible to, to uh, send the links for free trials you offer? Yes, I'll let Maureen in a soft kind of – how would you like to do that, Maureen? It, 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 we'll take care of it in a follow-up email. Okay. That's great. And then the oh. final question that we have is, on the detection map, I see that U.S. is on the top of the list. Can this be skewed because there are more Komodo endpoint deployments in the U.S.? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, let me just go over to a live instance, and for those that don't, I'm just going to pull up the actual uh, slide deck screen of that thread map. Again, this is available in the actual links and attachment section. Great thing to bookmark and save if you ever want to have some fun and test your current endpoint. Vendor, a security vendor on zero-day threats, and how good is their hips? You know, is this is a brand new... Uh, Brand new ransomware family. Uh, can my current solution stop it? Yes or no? Again, it's like a game of Russian roulette. To answer the question, though, I'm going over to the threat map itself right now. And let me just pull up a live instance. What you'll see here is we do this on purpose. So obviously, we have about 100,000 brand new zero-day samples per day. We don't share all of those for security reasons. Obviously, this is a public-facing website. Um, our number one concern is that if bad actors got a hold of that, uh, they would easily see where the chinks in the armor of, of various vendors are because we include the virus total link as well. So we're only giving just a small sample set because we're trying to articulate a point that with, with traditional AV and even next-gen AV, it's like a game of Russian roulette when it comes to zero days. With us, like, let me play devil's advocate for a second. If there was actual, there's going to be files that we've never seen before that other vendors are going to have actual verdicts on. It's on their blacklist, but it's not on Komodo's because we don't, we're not omniscient, right? We're not all-knowing. However, anything that's unknown that comes onto one of our machines, 100% of the time, it gets trapped by our auto-containment technology, bulletproofing the customer down to hour zero. So to answer the question about where our endpoints are, if you let the map run for a good couple hours, again, this is in real time. You're seeing our data from, from uh, a couple of our internal tools report maybe about a 10-minute delay, but all these hashes, all these signatures are in real time. Uh, if you let it run for a full day, you'll actually, and if you were to watch it theoretically for a full day, you'll see about 50 to 100,000 signatures fly across the screen of brand new zero-day malware. But would you believe it? About 65% of our install base is outside of the U.S. So we do have a good uh, presence in the U.S. and even among U.S. enterprises, but a large percentage of our install base is outside of the U.S., uh, uh, Europe, Asia, South America. So you're going to, if you let the uh, machine run continually, it's nighttime in that part of the world right now, so there's not going to be a lot of activity. But if you let it run for many minutes, you'll see eventually, okay, there's a lot of activity going on in Europe right now. There's a lot of activity going on in Asia right now. Now there's a lot in, in the U.S. So hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, that was perfect. Okay. Okay. Well, with that, we're going to wrap for today. I'd like to thank Dr. Kenneth Gears and Trip9 for your presentations and information around um, geopolitical events and, and the rise of malware. And Trip's great overview of what about that 1% and Komodo Cybersecurity Security's auto containment. So I appreciate your time. And with that, we're going to end the webinar today. Thank you, everyone, for joining. An on-demand version of this webinar will be sent to you following uh, this webcast. So thank you and good day. Take care. Thank you.